ओम ज्ञान ज्ञानंजन शलाकाय चक्षुन मीलित तस्मय श्री गुरव नम Translation There were emerald staircases which led to lakes full of variously colored lotus flowers and lilies and swans karandavas chakravarkas cranes and similar other valuable birds were visible in those lakes Purport It appears that not only was the palace surrounded by compounds and gardens with varieties of trees but there were small man-made lakes also where the water was full of many colored lotus flowers and lilies and to get down to the lakes there were staircases made of valuable jewels such as emeralds by the beautifully positioned garden houses there were many luxuriant birds such as swans chakravarkas karandavas and cranes these birds generally do not live in filthy places like crows do the atmosphere of the city was very healthy and beautiful it can simply be imagined from its description i'll read the next verse also utana pado raja shif prabhavam prabhavam tanayasya tam शुवा दृष्टवादे विस्मयंपरम द सैनिक किंग उथाना पाद हियरिंग ऑफ द ग्लोरियस डीड्स ऑफ ध्रुव महाराज एंड पर्सनली सीइंग आल्सो हाउ इन्फ्लुएंशियल एंड ग्रेट ही वाज फेल्ट वेरी सैटिस्फाइड फॉर ध्रुव्स एक्टिविटीज वर वंडरफुल टू द सुप्रीम डिग्री पोपोट व्हेन ध्रुव महाराज वाज इन द फॉरेस्ट एक्जीक्यूटिंग हिज ऑस्टेरिटीज हिज फादर उथाना पाद heard everything about his very wonderful activities although dhruv maharaj was the son of a king and was only 5 years old he went to the forest and executed devotional service under strict austerity therefore his acts were all wonderful and when he came back home naturally naturally because of his spiritual qualifications he became very popular among the citizens he must have performed many wonderful activities by the grace of the lord no one is more satisfied than the father of a person who is dedicated credited with glorious activities maharaj utana pada was not an ordinary king he was a rajarshi a saintly king a saintly king formerly this earth was ruled by one saintly king only kings were trained to become saintly therefore they had no other concern than the welfare of the citizens these saintly kings were properly trained as and as mentioned in bhagavad gita also the science of god or the yoga system of devotional service known as bhagavad gita was spoken to the saintly king of the sun planet and gradually it descended through the kshatriya kings who were generated from the sun and the moon if the head of the government is saintly certainly the citizens become saintly and they are very happy because both their spiritual and physical needs and hankerings are satisfied you know, maharaj utana pada's palace was uh, certainly very opulent more opulent than anything we can imagine to see nowadays his palace was surrounded by various gardens in which there were small lakes it said here to the approach to which was by staircases made of emeralds we can hardly imagine that nowadays one emerald is quite valuable and to have a, a staircase made of it and we can't imagine that and then what kind of security would you have to have for, for in, in nowadays you had outside emeralds and then you'd have to have a you'd have to have security to protect the security staff from stealing the the emeralds and full of and various beautiful birds were there hungsa is translated as swan 
I wonder what kind of swan that is, because I never saw any swans in India. I wonder. Maybe they all left or something. I wonder exactly what bird a hamsa is. Although I was told, you remember I was speaking with Gidri Govinda about that. He said, yeah, there's so many in Orissa, but I never saw any. Maybe they're migrating swans. I mean, I went to Orissa so many times. And these other, anyway, these seem to be some kind of generic terms. Karandava, duck. I mean, there's no, there's no such, if you want to see any particular bird, there's, in English, there's no, bird called exactly a duck. There are varieties of ducks. It's, it's a genre or a specific, it's a type. It's a cult. It's a type, yeah. The most common duck is, in England, is called a mallard. But most people don't know that. They just call it a duck. There are so many, and geese also. Chakravaka, geese, what? What I know in English is called a goose. It's, it's a little different to a chakravaka, but these are these are very broad terms. Someone can research in future what are the what are the meanings of these exact meanings. Chakravaka, yeah, I saw a photo of that. It's a smaller bird, a goose. It's more like what in Bengali they call hams, which comes from hamsa. Quite a quite a big bird and makes. But then again, there are so many varieties of geese, just like in Vishakha Patna, we were there, there is horrible geese making noise all the time. Anyway, they're very nice birds. Um, these are all very nice birds. We don't find the description of Maharaj Uthanapad. His, his palace was surrounded by crows. That's in the modern cities, the, apart from the ubiquitous sparrows, which are pretty much everywhere all over the world, the uh, crow is the most common bird because people throw garbage out everywhere. As soon as there's any garbage thrown around then, uh, or food thrown out, then crows come. They come here also, you might have noticed. They might have been here before. So anyway, Maharaj Uttangapada was living amidst opulence which we can hardly imagine in the present day price of, even to, even to get a little tiny apartment in Bombay, the price is, you can hardly turn around in it, and it costs so much money, just to buy some, even in Surat, that Radha Charan bought an apartment, cost, an apartment in Surat costs more than a crore of rupees, so, even rich people, they, they can, they can't even live in a house, they have to live in an apartment. <laughs> what a miserable condition. The Maharaj Uttanapada was living amidst great opulence and uh, the, the description that's given of him at the present time, he's very happy, though he went through a period of great unhappiness despite all his opulence. The unhappiness was caused by his uh, son going away and he thought, he heard his son had gone to the forest, so he thought there's no way he can stay alive in the forest. He must be already uh, digested by a tiger or a lion or something like that. So, so amidst his great opulence, and despite being a very uh, good person, he's a Rajarshi, same thing. Like he suffered because of some discrepancy in his behavior. He didn't control his second wife who spoke harshly and meanly to Dhruv Maharaj, which uh, occasioned him leaving home, Dhruv Maharaj leaving home. So we can see that just because of a few words, Dhruv Maharaj became so upset and then the whole household became so upset and presumably the whole kingdom became so upset. So, this dissent or different outlook, the, 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 the two 
Actually, the king didn't agree with, he didn't like that, but he, out of weakness, he felt powerless to protect Dhruva Maharaj. So that was his weakness. He was overcome by his wife, by his second wife. He, he felt afraid of her, it seems. He's a saintly king who can fight with so many enemies, but he was afraid. That, oh, now my wife is speaking very strongly, and he could have at that moment said that, hey, listen, don't speak like that, and put her in her place, but he didn't. And uh, as a result, well, she, she uh, had already committed an offense to a, a Vaishnav to be. Hoyechin <laughs> Hoiben, Prabhur Dato Dash, as Devikinandan Das in his prayers to the Vaishnav says that all the Vaishnav, all the Vaishnavas and even those in future, those who will be Vaishnavas, I, I offer my obeisances to them. So, uh, Uttanapada Maharaj, he tolerated that offense and tolerance of an offense one also becomes an offender if one knows what is right this vidur said when the uh, when Draupadi was attended well when she was insulted in the public assembly he said that anyone who knows what is right they, and what is wrong what is dharma and they fail to speak out in seeing some uh, adharma, someone being offended, then they also become party to that offense. They become sinful. So that's vidura niti. It's well known even to vidura's instructions, moral instructions. But uh, that's the nature of the material world. It's a place of envy, of dislike of others. Ichha dvesha samudhena dvandamohya hena parata sarva putani samoham sarge yanti parantapa. In this material world, everyone comes because they have material desires. And Dvish, bad feeling toward Krishna, which expands as bad feeling toward others. And in this way there's duality. My friend, this is my friend, because he helps me in my plans to fulfill my desires. And this one is my enemy, because he's a rival to me. So in this way we're born in this world. So even in the Satya Yuga, or even in the higher planets, these uh, symptoms are there, which destroy all the arrangements for living very nicely. So much, uh, it must have been a big job to arrange gardens like that and a palace like that. But nevertheless, despite all those arrangements, because of some bad feeling towards others, there was such a disturbance. So we see that also in the, uh, it's the whole history of the whole material world. How many examples can we give? There's, there's so many, Shastric and non-Shastric, the, the whole material world is full of dissent, and especially in Kali Yoga, where the Icha and Dvesha is, is on a more, the, the Dvesha, the bad feeling is more, it's uh, more grossly expressed than in previous ages, and there's a lot more of it, and material desires also tend to be very gross. In Vedic culture, I mean, practically the Vedas, as the uh, Purvimimamsakas, they say, that, or Karma Kandis, that the Vedas are meant for attaining a position for material enjoyment. Because actually most of the Vedas, at least what 
is extant in human society. It does. Trigunya Vishayo Veda. It's, it's mostly full of how to live in this world happily and go to the higher planets. Well, it's not the ultimate goal of the Vedas, as the Purva Mimamsaks say. Uttara Mimamsaks. Mimamsaks. They're namely the Vedantists. They say, Atato Brahma Jignasa. Now we should inquire into the nature of spirit, spiritual reality. So, uh, especially in the modern age, there's so much dissent and in this uh, second verse, which I read, Srila Prabhupada is talking about the saintly rulers and one saintly king, and of course there would be regional kshatriyas also. So, the, but the, they were very special people. Kshatriyas were very special. We can't imagine in the modern age and in the present time what a kshatriya like Uttanapad is like, how they they ruled. In some ways you could say it was easier to rule because there was a system, uh, the Varnashram system was in place and people were better than they are nowadays. Nevertheless, he was a very, I suppose these Rajarshis, they were very special people and they were trained from birth and how to rule. It's not that anyone could do it, like in the modern age we Someone gets elected, or they, they appointed as a leader, but they, they may not be actually fit to lead. They don't have what are called leadership qualities. Just like you could say the present Prime Minister of India, he's, of course he may not be in the seat for more than a few more days, but uh, he doesn't, I, I mean, I don't think it's unfair to say he doesn't, he doesn't have natural leadership qualities. He's more like a, bureaucrat, but somehow he's on the post. And, uh, others, uh, you might say uh, Mahatma Gandhi or, he, he, or Indira Gandhi, even she had leadership qualities, even though, I mean demoniac actually, I mean by doing politics and so many things. Even, though, even then Prabhupada didn't want her as the leader because she was a woman. <laughs> So, anyway, she was more naturally took charge. So, uh, some people have leadership qualities, but not that many. There are various reasons for that, I suppose. People are trained in the modern age to be like shudras. And some people are dominant by their personality, but that to be dominating of others doesn't necessarily mean to be a leader. And that's one of the qualities of a leader. Ishvara Bhava. He has the feeling like I'm in charge. But that's also, that's mentioned as one of the qualities of a Kshatriya in Bhagavad Gita by Lord Krishna. But then again, Ishvara Bhava in the, uh, in the 16th chapter is uh, this uh, Ishvara Ham, the feeling that I am the controller is already declared as being demoniac. So, how do those two go together? Well, the leader should be a... I mean, it seems to be contradictory, doesn't it? That a demon thinks, I am the controller, and a kshatriya is supposed to feel that he's a controller. But we can understand from this purport, Srila Prabhupada writes about the Rajarshis. They, they control on behalf of the Supreme Lord. They, they, they take charge. They're responsible. Not like in the modern age where, as Srila Prabhupada pointed out, you, you elect some leaders and then you pay them taxes, but you, you can't sleep at night except by locking your doors and having a security system. That's, that's why you pay taxes. You're supposed to, it's supposed to be the job of the government to make sure there's no thieves. But they are the thieves. That's the problem. <laughs> so, so, what can you do? It's an impossible situation for the citizens. Lecharaj and Yarupina, what is that? Uh, hmm? 
Prajas Prajaste Bhakshayashanti Mlecha Rajanya Rupinaha. The, the Mlechas in Kali Yuga they will take the position of kings or leaders and they will devour the citizens. And they will they instead of having Raja Dharma, they will have Dasyu Dharma. The, the, they're thieves. That's, it's already predicted in Bhagavata that the lead, the thieves become the leaders, and that's prominent in in India. It's I mean, even profession. Many uh, the bigger professional gundas and or uh, I say gunda in English. Uh, it's like prayer. gangsters. Yeah, gangsters is a good term. So they find that, you know, better than being a, a, a gangster is to be a politician. Because then, you know, well, you know, you know, there's so much money you can get. So, uh, that's what they're doing. Many, many of the politicians in India are actually gangsters. You have cinema stars turned politicians and you have gangsters. There's many more gangsters turned into politicians. And then there are others who are the politicians from the beginning. They, they, they're just, they, they weren't gangsters as such, but anyway, they do the same thing. So, it's a very bad situation. This democracy came about. Actually, all over the world, there were kings previously. But when they, in, in Europe, there were kings and they were supposed to be religious. They got their power their, or their authorization to rule from the Pope, the leader of the church, or I guess in the, in the uh, eastern part of Europe, the Orthodox churches. The, but when the kings became simply interested in their own sense gratification, and they weren't, inter- they, they were more interested in exploiting the citizens rather than being interested in the welfare of the citizens, as is stated here then the citizens uh, threw them out. And they made the rule of the people. Which means that it comes the same. Whoever, in, instead of having a hereditary kingship, it means whoever can be, whoever is the most smart and expert in fooling people that you, you want to do good for them, be, gets elected. Or even you don't have to convince them that you're doing good for them. You just have to have enough sub-gangsters around you and then you uh, take over the voting booth by force. And, or if anyone votes the wrong way, you chop off their hands. I mean, yeah, these things do happen in India. Or if people who are known to vote for the other party come, they're physically uh, for- forced not to enter the voting booth. I mean, at the pain of death. So... Uh, democracy isn't a very good system also. And it also breeds the, uh, this democracy is the, is bred the idea that everyone should have their own opinion, but then that, that breeds more dissent, because everyone then is wondering, well, my opinion, my opinion should go, and everyone thinks they, everyone, it's, it's a funny thing, you'll see, uh, they started doing this in India also. They they walk up to people on the street, the, the TV interviewers, they walk up to people on the street and say, that, well, what do you think about the uh, present economic plan or something? And these people, have, they've never studied economics. They have no idea whatsoever. They say, where are you? And, you know, they don't know anything. And they're, they're supposed to... They, everyone considers themselves an authority on everything. Which also makes it very difficult to rule because there's always dissent. People don't trust the leaders. Or, they, or the, the business of the opposition party is even if the government does bring in some good legislation, they oppose it on principle. And on the rare occasions that they bring in something that might actually benefit the people. And the, uh, the opposition party, because they're sworn to oppose the, the, uh, present party, they, they just oppose it. 
So it, it makes uh, ruling or leading very difficult. Um, they have a whole, uh, so many books and seminars, it's a whole area of study or academics on management studies and training how to be a manager. You know, not leadership studies, management studies. It's like managing, you You know, I don't really want to call it a leader. They don't like that term because it's democracy, right? We're all the same. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, managers, they're mostly, they're not leaders anyway. They're, they're appointed bureaucrats and they, they often can't take decisions. And, is it? and uh, or conflict management is part of management studies. How to manage a conflict, because there are so many conflicts all the time, because people have different opinions. And one, uh, utopian idea which is common but I say, as I say a utopian impractical is the idea live and let live in other words what do we, just every opinion is okay so whatever opinion people have you, sh you may not agree with them but you respect their opinion well, who, who is that some I remember at school some teacher was quoting some philosopher or other saying that well, I don't, I don't agree with someone else's opinion, but I would die to uphold their right to keep it. Something like that. So, the right to have different opinions. And because of this idea, the demarcation between right and wrong has, in people's minds, gone out in many cases because they think, well, you know, it's just... There's no real right or wrong, everything's relative, just people have different opinions, that's all. But it's quite impractical in, practic in practical life, because opinions, uh, the implementation of them have consequences. Just like uh, in the Western world at the present time, and now it's being brought to India also, because India must follow the Western world in everything they do. And within our society, the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, there is uh, much debate on whether or not what they call homosexual marriage should be allowed. So we may say, well, everyone should respect everyone else's opinion, but it, it, how does that work? Because either it's allowed or it's not allowed. And you can't say that, well, you can say, well, those who agree with it, they can do it. And, but, wait a minute, that means it's allowed. And there are people who say that it's intrinsically wrong because marriage is a, uh, was originally a sacred right, religiously ordained right, and it's meant for procreation, which is not possible in homosexual relationships. So that's just one example where you, it can't be both ways. If, if you say, well, we, whatever, whatever people like, they should be allowed to do, but then uh, how far does that go? I want to uh, eat my children. So, you know, it's my right, I produce them, and uh, I, it's my opinion. And how far does opinion go? And what are the limits? And actually, people are completely confused, and because of this idea that what are the, they don't have any fixed dimensions of right and wrong. They have no standard. And, uh, and then there are different opinions. And, so, and when there are different opinions, there's dissent. And because there are always at least two ways of doing things. Or there are different things that, there are different things that you can do. There are different ways of doing things. And uh, you talk about trying to reach a consensus, but you may never reach a consensus because just like, uh, well, for instance, if we in Iskon, if we wanted to make a, uh, on the issue of homosexual marriage, if we wanted to make a consensus, 
uh, you know what that means when everyone comes to some agreement it's like maybe halfway or other but I don't I'm a member of ISKCON and I'm not going to go halfway or part away or 10% of the way or 1% of the way I'm always going to oppose homosexual marriage so there's no question of a consensus on that issue and I am one of course there are many others also so it's a nice idea consensus that we all we come somewhere halfway and actually I don't think anyone in well there are there are of course but but uh, most of the leaders of ISKCON they're not for homosexual marriage but some say well not exactly marriage but you know something almost like that and so what's wrong with that can't you accept that it's like we're making a, we're making a concession so but no we don't <laughs> accept it we're, we're, we don't we, because the what's given by Shastra we have to follow of course others will say yes but Shastra and different times and places so everyone has their different arguments so it becomes very difficult and actually the uh, GBC who is the GBC body who are leading our society is a difficult situation for them because they have to lead and they are sworn to the principle unity in diversity which Prabhupada used that term but uh, how diverse is the diversity? There's, there's, what are the limits of diversity? Now they have to face that. Uh, they have to face that because you can't satisfy everyone. They're, they're attempting to, their policy in recent years seems to have been to try to satisfy everyone or at least satisfy those, uh, the majority. But uh, like I say, how far can you go? It's a very divisive issue. I'm just giving this as an example. I, I don't really, it's not my, I mean, I've talked about this plenty enough on other occasions, but uh, I'm just giving it as an example of how, uh, yeah, ultimately, leaders do have to take decisions, and that affects others. And if they don't take a decision, that in itself is a decision. Just like if if they don't say, if if, Members of our society start holding, as has happened, starting holding ceremonies to bless gay unions and the GBC doesn't stop it, then ipso facto they're allowing it. So not saying, not making a decision is also making a decision. They make a decision not to make a decision, which means they allow it. So, what should we do? Srila Prabhupada wrote that the GBC authority should be followed in all circumstances. But then we have to see whether the GBC gets its authority from us. They have to also follow their authorities, which is Guru, Sadhu and Shastra. So it becomes divisive. This is the point. It becomes divisive. On every issue, there can be different opinions. And it, it may not as uh, not even as major as this uh, social issue, which I've just been alluding to, or not alluding to, talking about. Um, what's for breakfast this morning? I want parathas. I want idlis. I want lots of chilies and no chilies. Someone has to make a decision unless you cook individually for every different person. Of course you're supposed to cook for Krishna. But uh, we see often actually in temples that uh, devotees get disturbed because they don't like the prasada. And so that's just one thing. And there are so many different things and there may be so many different opinions and well, you can see it's very difficult to lead. What to speak of leading a, a whole society or leading a country to lead a, even a temple or even a Sankirtan party can be difficult because everyone has their own opinion and my opinion should be respected. In other words, you should do what I say. But 
You can't do what everyone says. Someone has to take a decision and then someone has to follow it. Everyone else has to follow it. And, uh, I mean, on basic, basic things, everyone should follow it. Otherwise, it becomes impossible to organize anything. Just like if, you know, who's going to cook for breakfast? And then, all right, let's sit down and, you know, discuss it for three hours and then we'll come to... It doesn't work. Someone has to do it. The, the leader should be followed. And leadership, as we see from the example of Maharaj Uttanapati, is not simply a, it's not simply a question of of having a position and giving orders, but one has to consider the welfare of the citizens. One actually has to win the trust of others. Some people, their leaders, well, there are different ways of leading. Just like uh, in recent history, Stalin and Hitler, they were leaders. Of course, Hitler, he had the confidence of his people. I don't know so much about Stalin, but Stalin, he's famous as ruling by fear. Everything worked very nicely in Russia when he was in charge, because people are afraid if they, if they didn't do things properly, then uh, they wouldn't be doing things much more. Literally, he killed, he killed far more people than... They, Hitler did, right? They, they, they say that Hitler was the enemy, but Stalin himself killed more of his own citizens than the so-called enemy. Actually, everyone. But, uh, well, that's one way of ruling by fear, but in a spiritual society, or society that's supposed to be spiritual, obviously that's not a very good way of ruling, and some fear should be there. In other words, people should feel afraid that if they, that, that may be required, uh, that someone will be uh, rebuked if they do something they're not supposed to do, or don't do something that they are supposed to do. But that's, uh, that's there in all leader to follow a relationship. The child is some, some fear of the father that the the uh, children in the school to the to the teachers nowadays that's not there in in the modern idea the children don't respect the teachers and the teachers can't teach properly because there's no discipline so you kind of elect people as leaders and so, or some people have very strong personalities and they kind of dominate people but that also it, in and of itself is not what we'd call a leadership quality, just to have a strong personality. One actually has to be concerned with the welfare of others, dedicated to the uh, task at hand, and uh, capable of making decisions, if you're always not sure what to do, because whatever you do, you don't know what the, res what the consequence will be. It, things might work out nicely and they might not work out nicely and with any leader however good they are it's, uh, at least in the modern age uh, you, it's not that every single decision that you make works out fully perfectly or as you envisaged it and you're going to make you may also make some actually you're practically certain to make mistakes also but still some people have the have the uh, ability to do that. Uh, I mean, we see that Srila Prabhupada sent devotees all over the world, and they managed to just go in different places, not even knowing the language, and they'd go into different countries, and they uh, they didn't actually know even much about Krishna consciousness. They were new devotees, like one year in the movement, two years in the movement. And they'd go and uh, they'd convince others to take up Krishna consciousness and start the movement and get the society registered and get some rent some place or buy some place. And they, they, Srila Prabhupada empowered them. And they made lots of mistakes also, no doubt. Uh, some of which we're suffering from even now, and the early leaders of our society. But they, they did manage to do that, which not everyone can do that. It's not... Some people, even if you appoint them as a leader, or 
or they think they want to take a position as a leader, they just they don't have the personality to do that. We see there are there are Brahmanas, Kshatriyas, Vaishyas, and Shudras, and by 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 these are basic personality types, and you just can't appoint someone to have a different personality. That okay, you've been uh, shining shoes for the last twenty years, and uh, now we want to make you the prime minister. And uh, well, it's not going to work, is it? If you if you ask a rickshaw driver to be- become the prime minister, it's not going to work. And if you ask the prime minister to be a rickshaw driver, he probably couldn't do it as well as the rickshaw driver. <laughs> so there's different kinds of mentality. And uh, we can understand this also, that uh, we're trained in the modern age, it's our, sh- it's our democratic training to have an opinion on everything and to disagree with everything. But you can't run a society like that, a spiritual society. You can't run it on simply everyone's different opinion. Someone has to take the leadership. And although it's very easy to have an opinion, it's not so easy to be a leader, as I discovered uh, very early in my time in Krishna consciousness, in as much as, uh, even before I was initiated, I was, uh, somehow or other, I got put in the, in the treasury office. I don't know why they did that, but anyway, Janananda Maharaj now, he was the treasurer at Bhaktivedanta Manor, and, uh, you know, it's not such an exciting job for someone who likes to go out and preach, as he's famous for doing even today. So, he wanted out of there and somehow or other they stuck me in there. So, uh, it didn't last very long. (laughs) I wanted to get out too. (laughs) But uh, I saw from the beginning that the the leaders, they're like, because I was in contact with the leaders of the temple. It was quite a big temple and it was one of the biggest temples in the world at that time. still is. So, I saw how the, the the leaders, they're under like pressure from everyone. Everyone, wa- they, everyone wants this and they want that and they, they want so many different things which they, they, they can't fulfill the desires of everyone. And then people call in. Actually, in those days, there wasn't so much dissent, but then they think, oh, uh, I didn't do it my way. And then they talk to others and make a little group among themselves. And they feel, oh, the leaders are mistreating us and they don't care for us. And, and people get on all kinds of mental trips, but the fact is that you can't satisfy everyone's desires, and that's not the aim of the Krishna Conscious Movement anyway, to satisfy everyone's desires. So, what's in, in the secular world, certain commentators, there are plenty of commentators, political commentators, commentators on everything sports commentators and they analyze the and they analyze the news and they analyze the the, the football games they and they're very expert at analyzing everything but one of the things they've analyzed is that there's a shortage of leaders in the modern age at every level in in in, in every sphere in every activity there's a saying there's there's not much room at the top but as margaret thatcher who was also a leader, a real leader, actually. Although, as I said, Prabhupada didn't approve of women like this. But she said, who said there's no room at the top? There's plenty of room at the top. <laughs> because she, she was a heavy character. And she, so, uh, she was, anyway, she got at the top and eventually people got fed up of her and threw her out, as always happens in, in any uh, situation in the modern age. But uh, we find that in 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 politics, if you see, the, the, just like the, even this present election, who are the possible pre- prime ministerial candidates? They're, from what I can, they're pretty mediocre. They say Advani, a real leader, but it doesn't strike me. I don't know. Uh, and uh, Manmohan Singh, I already spoke about. Uh, 
And uh, you, you see, like the leaders of countries, and no, uh, we don't see like great persons as there were in, in I mean, really, really uh, great leaders. Very. One reason may be again that it's it's difficult to lead in the modern age, even if someone, even if someone of high caliber came. Would people follow? Would people follow Mahatma Gandhi nowadays? If if he came as a person like that, so it's uh, the present educational system makes people very mediocre. The whole way of life makes people mediocre. So, if there is someone who is actually capable of taking up leadership at any level in our society, that. Um, it would be prudent on the path of others to try and help them and cooperate with them. Because, yeah, as I found out in my first few weeks practically in the movement, that it's easy to criticize, but it's not so easy to, uh, to actually take a leadership role. It's very easy to say, well, he should do this and he should do that, but and if you, see, this often happens that there is some, there's a revolution in a country, and there's a, the revolutionary leader. When he becomes the governmental leader, he's a complete flop. He's good at getting organizing people to throw over the present system, but then when he comes in, he's they they they, they don't make very good leaders themselves. I mean, Bangladesh, it was Mujibur Rahman, for instance. He took over the government and, and then uh, he got assassinated. He wasn't doing a very good job. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, with our, there's a, within our society, Iskon, there's a lot of discontent with our leaders and uh, but uh, we should also understand it's it's not so easy to lead. It's not such. We can bear that in mind and pray to Uttanapada and Dhruv Maharaj, that Rama and Yudhishthira, that better than all these elections, if we have one one Rama, one Yudhishthira, one Parikshit, with sword in hand. Wandering the earth, Parikshit, to uh, rectify the discrepancies. Where is such a king nowadays? I mean, you're talking about Varnashram. Actually, Varnashram means there has to be a king. So you can designate someone a Kshatriya, but you're not even allowed to be a Kshatriya by law in the modern age. So that's something to be considered. Anyway, Srila Prabhupada's idea was that. Uh, if there are Brahmins, then everything else can follow from that. Anyway, that's another discussion. Any question about this, please? Question, criticism? <laughs> Don't criticize. <coughs> well, we're supposed to be, it's it's another conundrum. If you, if you don't know what that word is yet, go and look it up, because I've used it four times in the last two days now. So, uh, on the one hand, devotees are supposed to be independently thoughtful. On the other hand, supposed to be disciplined. So, how do you do that? Well, independent, independent thoughtfulness is meant for brahmanas who are disciplined because they're self-disciplined. They're not disciplined by the state. They're not. They're not to be punished by kshatriyas because they're self-disciplined. So they may be independently thoughtful, but they do also, uh, just like the advisors of the king, they may, the king may ask his different advisors, brahmanas, ministers, for their opinion, and different ones will give their opinion on what to be, they may give different opinions, or they, they may support, someone says something and someone says, yes, I support that, and this is why, or someone else may say, no, I oppose this, there's a, another way to do it, and another one says, well, I support it, but I'd like to modify it somewhat. So they, but then uh, they have to 
then they, they, instead of confusing the king, they have to come to some consensus among themselves what is to be done. And if they're actual Brahmins, they can do that because they're uh, because they they uh, know what is shastra and they know uh, how to apply that. That's the idea. They should, and, and, or, or if they don't come in, if there is uh, some disagreement on some point, then they submit to the uh, eldest and most learned and most qualified, and they go on with life. <laughs> But it can be difficult to ascertain what is dharma. When you in the beginning of when you read the beginning of Bhagavad Gita, it seems like everything Arjuna is saying is is very good arguments, and Krishna didn't accept it at all. Yeah. So, is there any point? And the devotees are uh, even themselves that they have any Devotees giving a new service, and what should be their attitude in? Devotee takes up some new service. Yeah. What should be the attitude of the devotee? Maybe he does not have the propensity or doesn't. Doesn't have the propensity to do such and such a service. Well, that's another discussion. There's there are two considerations. One is being engaged according to one's propensity, and another is doing the needful. So. Uh, doing the needful is always more important than doing what we, or what our propensity is. And it may be that uh, we're engaged in various services, that, that may not be a lifelong engagement, but to get some experience in that, that may be an ed- educational for us also, uh, that may combine with doing the needful. In other words, something may need to be done and we're engaged in that service and although we feel that we'd rather do something else or we feel more inclined to do something else, we do it anyway and we can take it as an educational experience. And in, 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 at least in due course of time, generally devotees, they do get engaged in what's their propensity. It just kind of happens naturally in course of time. In the beginning, they they may be engaged in various kinds of services, but eventually they gravitate towards the service that is uh, that they feel satisfied in doing, and generally they do that better. It's not that everyone has to do the same thing, nor is it practical for everyone to do the same thing. It's, there are so many different services which require to be performed. But at least in in the beginning of one's time in Krishna consciousness, or in setting up a new center, then uh, do do what you're told is the first thing for they have for newcomers coming, and uh, of course you should help them if they don't know how to do it, and uh, and not only just to help them practically in showing how to, for instance, cook chapatis if they don't have any experience of that, but also help them by preaching to them, that encourage them in their service, like that. And setting up a new center, then everyone, when in the beginning there's new center means one or two devotees usually, and everyone has to do everything. And there's no question, it's not my propensity, you just have to do it, that's all. Otherwise it's not, the new center doesn't develop. And by that spirit of service, it develops, because then other people want to join. If they see that everyone's serving so selflessly for, for the sake of pleasing Krishna, then that, that selfless service attracts others. But if there's backbiting and dissent and no one wants to cooperate with others, then who will want to join? And it doesn't develop. Or even if something's developed, it can, uh, it can collapse if that spirit enters. And Maya enters. Devotees are cooperating nicely to serve Krishna. And then the Kali quarrel enters. And then everyone becomes discontent and they go away. 
And uh, the whole endeavor which has been built up with much struggle can break down. So we should be very careful about this. It's no small thing or easy thing to develop a Krishna conscious center. We see that there are many centers of our society which they haven't developed in years. There's hardly anyone joins. And they're just like that. They're just going on day to day. And nothing, nothing much is developing. So, if something is developing, we should be careful not to uh, act in a way that can damage the healthy development. That means if, for instance, we we feel something is not being done in a in the in the best possible way, then we can express that to others. That, that doesn't mean over every little thing we have to give an opinion. Also, I mean, one thing about a leader is they have to be given some some room to develop things according to the way Krishna inspires them. And those who who are not, they don't have that uh, ability to go to a place and develop it, then they should recognize that and, and not try to interfere with that. He said, all right, you know, someone's doing something. Yeah. Prabhupada was like that. He gave devotees room to Give them room to work in. You train devotees and then send them and give, give them some room to work in. Let them develop something. And Prabhupada didn't like try to... He'd give general guidelines, but he didn't say it. He didn't try to manage every little detail. It's not possible anyway. So, uh, yeah, that should be respected. That... Uh, if someone, is, there's so much, uh, they feel it should be done in a different way, this way, that way, the other way, then, well, maybe Krishna will give them a chance at some point to develop a center or a project of their own. But then in many cases, those who are given that chance, they can't do much. They don't have that leadership quality. So then just be content. <laughs> Better. Otherwise, if everyone says, well, it shouldn't be like this, it should be like that. You shouldn't have put ten chilies in the subject, they should have put nine chilies and oh, I don't know, everything. It's, it's, it's become, then everyone becomes discontent over everything. You just All right, the, you see the basic things are going on. Chanting Hare Krishna is going on. Preaching is going on, promised books are being distributed, the deity worship is going on nicely, things are expanding. If, there, if those things are there, then we should be content. And if there's, if there's too many chilies in the sabji, well, maybe we can you know, mix it with the dial or something. Or, or just ask, that's a common problem in our society. You know, maybe here, yeah, not enough chilies. It's always, there's always some discontent over the number of chilies or... No. Always, someone wants more and someone wants less. So, but it shouldn't be such that it, over that we we just you know make a political party or something. <laughs> and maybe other issues also, apart from.